He says, 1 Timothy was written so that you and I will know how we live. When we talk about God's household, we're actually talking about God's home, God's family. So when, when I say as a member of my family, and as I've reminded my boys what their last name is many times in their life, and they rolled their eyes at me, hey, your last name is Ellison, so you represent more than you. You re represent me. You represent our family. You represent your grandparents and those people you dearly love and respect. Here's what Paul's saying to Timothy. This letter was written so that you know how to live your life with God's name. With the name of Jesus Christ as your king, how do you conduct yourself? How do you live as God's family and God's household? And that's what he's talking about there. So that's why this letter was written, not only for pastors and deacons, but for every member of the church. We've also been driving home over these weeks with loving the church like Jesus, that uh, local committed church membership is not just a tired tradition, but it's actually essential of how we do life together, how we love one another, how we serve one another, how we carry out accountability and discipline and ministry, how we do all of those things. And if you don't have commitment to a local church and you're just randomly floating around as a Christian, you can't live out the majority of the New Testament of how it's calling us to practically live our lives. And so he's saying here, this was written so that you'll know how to live your life, how to conduct yourself in God's household because you're in God's family. Timothy is a pastor, the deacons, the members of the church. And then he goes on to describe God's household, God's family. And that's the last part of verse 15. He says, how to conduct yourself in God's household or God's family, which is the church of the living God. So we've been talking about what church is. Remember, it was this random kind of common word before Jesus came on the scene in the Gospels that church was just a separate, called out, set apart group. It could have been for a community organization. It could have been for politics. It could have been for business or a tradesmith, a union or anything like that. But Jesus took this general word of church, the assembly, and really gave it new meaning that today, uh, what I, one of the things I'm thankful for is so many words are getting redefined that the word church is only distinctively used for Christianity, and I'm thankful for that. And so he's saying the church, this called out, set apart people committed to God's family, as God's family, he says, you are the church of the living God. It's interesting that uh, he had to use the word living God because in Ephesus, what did they have? They had dozens, if not hundreds, of dead gods. They were stones, they were idols along the main streets of the city. They had their Diana and their Artemis, and, and they were worshiping that and giving sacrifices and doing all kind of um, uh, just uh, immoral acts to supposedly to their dead gods. And he says, remember, this is how you live uh, in God's family, that you are the called out, set apart assembly of the living God. Because we must remember in a world full of all kind of small g gods or idols, uh, many more here in America than even Ephesus had, uh, that we serve the one true living God. And that changes everything. Because we all like to make our own idols, right? We all like to make an idol of what we want God to be so he can kind of be what we want. He'll actually be our servant instead of us, his servant. And so in that day <laughs> with Artemis, with Diana, with all the hundreds of gods they had, they crafted gods for what they wanted to be. You know, you've heard people say, hey, I don't believe in a God like this or I only believe in a God like that. And if whatever that is doesn't line up with God's word, it's only an idol. Uh, and so he's saying, listen, you need to know how to live your life. How do you live this out? That's what 1 Timothy is about as God's family, that you are part of the set-apart group, the church, the local defined church of the living God. All through the Old Testament, uh, it talks about God being the one living God uh, as opposed to what we think of as a dead God of an idol that's mute and can't talk and can't help us at all. But then he goes on to describe the church, not only by being in God's family, the living God, but then this last phrase, if you look in verse 15 uh, there, he says this, uh, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. Some translations will say uh, bulwark. Uh, some translations will say support of the truth. And so I want you to understand the gravity of you today if you are in Christ and you are connected, committed in a local church membership you are actually a part of the support of the truth. Interestingly enough, Jesus, when he was before Pilate, right before he was crucified, he'd already been beaten and had false accusations made against him. 
and Pilate was interrogating him and trying to get him to say um, what he thought he was. And Paul, Pilate was actually amazed that he, thinks, he thought Jesus was who he said he was. He was actually intimidated by Jesus. And so Pilate asks him, what's he doing? Why is he here? And here's what Jesus' response was in, in the Gospels. Jesus said, for this reason I was born to bear witness to the truth. You know, when we think of Christmas, you don't think of the crucifixion, but Jesus actually said why he was born right before he was crucified. He says, for this reason I was born to bear witness to the truth. We know the very popular verse of John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth or truth way or the life, the life way. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so we see that Jesus is the truth. He is the truth that was made flesh and dwelt among us. He was the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. But God is telling you and me here, not just the church at Ephesus, but he's telling Wiregrass Church uh, that we are in God's family, so we need to live differently from the rest of the world. We are the church, this set-apart group of the one living God, and we are the pillar and the foundation of the truth. An interesting picture that was on the, uh, the title image for today, it's a picture of uh, this kind of Colosseum, or not a Colosseum, but this temple. And it actually wasn't a church temple in our title sermon image today, uh, but it had all of these columns in front of it. And what it was was, in the, in the town of Ephesus, they had this huge uh, temple that had 127 columns in it, okay? Uh, and it was many of the columns had gold and, and different types of uh, precious uh, pearls and diamonds and different things in it. Because that was how they worshipped this god of Diana, this god of Artemis. Uh, and, and so they looked at this centerpiece of their city, uh, of this one kind of big, if you want to call it portico. Uh, it had 127 columns, and it was actually designed to be something that was impenetrable, something that wouldn't be broken down. Uh, if you ever think of something, like even in this room here, uh, we don't have any columns in the middle of it because it's made to span a distance uh, and, and having the structural support all around the edges of this building. So if you're an architect or an engineer, you know that because you don't want uh, anything impeding that. But the number of columns or pillars uh, that are in a building actually adds to its structural ability uh, that it'll be more safe and more sound. And so this one huge uh, temple was full of columns, like you had to walk in between all the columns of having 127 columns and how, how unlikely it would be uh, that that would fall down having that many columns. And so that was where they worshiped this goddess of Diana, of Artemis. And so in this city of Ephesus, where this was one of the centerpieces uh, of the city, um, we see that. God is making a point here through Paul. He's saying, listen, you, as the church, you are the pillar, you're the column, and you are the support of the truth. We know ultimately the foundation is Christ, who is the cornerstone that we sang earlier, and that the apostles are the foundation. It says that a number of times in Scripture. We, we base our life upon the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the apostles. Remember, that we don't dictate what Scripture says. We don't manipulate Scripture. Scripture actually dictates us. That's the real difference between true Christianity and a lot of forms of false Christianity. That a lot of forms of false Christianity and cults and false belief systems, they say, hey, we're going to make the Scripture believe what we want it to believe, or we'll make it say or add to it what we want. But as true Christians, the Bible is our true cornerstone and foundation, the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. We base our life on that. It doesn't change. We must change to adapt to it. And so what he is saying here in this last phrase, that you are the church, the called out, set apart assembly of the living God, he says here, as the pillar and the foundation or the support of the truth. So throughout the 2,000 years since the church has been birthed, and grown and continues to spread and multiply throughout the world, the number one priority of the church is we bear witness to the truth. Because in this day and age, as you know, in this culture, truth, relative truth, is changing by the moment. What's right and wrong is always changing from day to day and week to week. But the teachings of God, the teachings of Jesus Christ, never change. And so we can base our life upon this. But one of the things that you must realize as a member of the church is you're a if I can use the word a pillar, you're a column in the household of God that you continue to support the truth as you live by and for and in God's word.
It's interesting that um, if you go back and look at archaeology and even in recent days, that huge temple where the Greek god of Artemis of Diana was uh, the center point of the city and where they had that big uproar of saying, great is our god Artemis, that if you look at that city and then that town today, that huge magnificent temple that had 127 columns now only has just a few pieces of columns just laying around in the ruins of that city. And while that false god only had a temporary shelf life, so to speak, the one true God, the true church, has continued to spread throughout the world, even in the toughest of times. In the worst of persecution, actually the persecution actually causes the church to grow and to spread more. And so he's reminding them in 1 Timothy 3, he says, you not only need to know how to live in God's family and God's household, you are that set-apart group of the living God, And the church, you, us, we collectively, we are the pillar, the foundation, the support of the truth. And so we base our life on truth. In a world that has no absolute truth, we know the absolute truth. And it's part of our role to uphold and to support that as growing parts of God's body. And then in this last verse of chapter 3 and verse 16, he, he transitions from this very important hinge point of who the church is Uh, that we are to live correctly as God's family. We are uh, living for the living God. Uh, We're part of God's household, and we're the pillar and foundation of the church, of the truth. And then he says in this last verse, and most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. What's the mystery of godliness? Well, let me share this with you. The first thing uh, to understanding godliness is to realize that we are not godly. (laughs) We're actually ungodly. That's actually the first step towards understanding godliness. And when we understand that, that we reject and we've rebelled against God, then we can realize this mystery of godliness that has been shown throughout the ages. You see, in the Old Testament, there was this one family that was designed to be this nation, and they were to bring about this one special person, and we know his name, Jesus. And so all through the Old Testament, the goal was this one who was to come, who was going to save people from their sin, to save them for God, to make them right with God, to make them part of God's family, God's household. And so all of that through the Old Testament, we see glimpses of that in the nation of Israel, but we realize it's kind of a shadow, it's kind of veiled of what all God is doing in the Old Testament. We see bits and pieces of this one to come, uh, of this group that's going to be bigger than just Israelites, it's going to be non-Israelites, it's going to be Gentiles, it's going to be Americans and Europeans and Asians and Africans and, and people from all over the world. And we see glimpses of it in the Old Testament, but it doesn't really make sense to the people of that day. They just saw pieces of it. And now, today, as well as in this first century, when Paul was writing to Timothy in the church at Ephesus, you now see the mystery of godliness. Not only the Jews, some of them come to know Christ, but all these Gentiles are now coming to Christ, and they're part of this new nation, this new people group. They're part of this thing called the church. And so that's the mystery of godliness that was veiled and shadowed in the Old Testament. And now that we have the teaching, the life, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and we have the New Testament, we realize this mystery of godliness is completely unveiled, and we can understand true godliness through Jesus. And so he says, this is why I'm writing this to you. And then he goes into what could be considered a a doxology, maybe an ancient hymn of the first century. And he says this, And the most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. Remember what they were saying in Acts chapter 19 when that false god was in in jeopardy and trouble? How great is our god Artemis? How great is our goddess Diana? And so Paul here, maybe in uh, response to those still echoing in his mind years later after that attack he endured in Ephesus, he's saying the mystery of godliness, how great is our God. How great is our God. And so here's how he's going to explain it. He says this, He was manifested in the flesh. This is a poem here. Uh, He was vindicated in the spirit. He was seen by angels. He was preached among the nations. He was believed on in the world. And he was taken up in glory. Here's what he's trying to teach us here. We've got the gospel in a short poem. Sometimes words that we wouldn't understand or think about, but we need to think critically about them for a moment. And so he he moves from the importance of the church to us being the pillar and the foundation of the truth to now, here's how we realize the gospel in a short, 
very powerful and intense form. And he says, he was manifested in the flesh. The he is God, that God was manifested in the flesh. Uh, do you know that uh, we learn about Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 14, that the word, the logos, that the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you know one of the most important uh, doctrines you need to know as a follower of Christ is? Is that Jesus was and is completely God and completely man at the same time. Uh, it's a big 50 cent word called the hypostatic union. There's been no other person in history like him. But for us to have our theology and doctrine right as the church and being part of God's family, we must realize that Jesus was and is completely God, completely divine, and completely man. And so God became flesh. He put on flesh and blood and dwelt among us, we know, in the, in the uh, uh, nation of Israel. And so that is so important. And so here's how he's summing up the gospel here uh, in this last verse of, uh, of uh, 1 Timothy 3. So he says, and most certainly... The mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, okay? So we know that God became man. And then he says here, he was vindicated in the spirit. What does this word vindicated mean? We, we may use that word on occasion if somebody has been accused of something wrong, and rightfully so with Jesus. Jesus was accused of so many wrong things, but we know that he was completely just and perfect. But it says he was vindicated in the spirit. So what does that look like? Well, I'll give you some glimpses leading up to what it really means. But have you ever thought about when Jesus first went to John the Baptist at the beginning of his ministry? And he says, hey, I want you to baptize me, John. And John says, no way, I, I, I don't deserve to baptize you. You need to be baptizing me. And Jesus said, let it be to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus didn't need to be baptized. He was perfect. There was nothing for him to repent of, but he was setting the example. And what happened the moment after he was baptized? The Holy Spirit descended on him in a public, powerful way like a dove. And then the powerful voice of God the Father. We see a picture of the Trinity right there. It came from heaven and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And so we see this powerful point of the Holy Spirit uh, for everyone else to know. Jesus already knew it to show that God's Spirit was resting on him. Throughout his life, uh, we know that the, uh, the, the, the angels and the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit worked uh, with him in, in different ways, and we'll look at that more in just a moment. But you, you think about uh, how was Jesus fully vindicated or justified? There's this very powerful verse in Romans 1, 4 that we know that Jesus laid down his life for us on the cross. He died and was literally dead in a tomb for three days, Friday evening, Saturday till Sunday morning. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, it tells us that by the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Nobody else in all of history has ever been resurrected from the dead in the fullness of the resurrected body after three days like that. We do know that Jesus raised, restored people back to life, but no one has been resurrected in their new resurrected eternal body. And so he was vindicated in the spirit. Here's what God was saying. I put my seal of approval on Jesus, my son. Not only at his baptism, and we could talk about his transfiguration in other places, but when he was raised from the dead, I made it clear that not only was Jesus innocent, but he was fully just and justified and vindicated. And so God worked through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he was vindicated in the Spirit when he was raised from the dead. And then he goes on to say, after he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the Spirit, he was seen by angels. We know that angels are a kind of big part of the gospel story. Remember when Jesus was born, all the multitude of angels went and met the shepherds in the wilderness on uh, Christmas night, if you want to call it that, and they were singing this glorious uh, uh, hymn and praise. And so the shepherds uh, saw the multitude of angels were overcome with fear. Uh, we know that the angels, they ministered to Jesus at the end of his 40 days of temptation when he was at his weakest after Satan had tempted him and he'd overcome the Satan uh, by the Bible, by the scripture, and the angels ministered to him. And so we see angels at work throughout his ministry. Uh, but what's interesting is that on the morning that Jesus arose from the grave, who was hanging back at the tomb when Jesus was already gone, the angels were there saying, I don't know why you're looking for Jesus here. He is not here anymore. He has risen, just as he said he would. And nobody could believe it. Even though they were overwhelmed by angels and the tomb was empty, 
but he was seen by angels. Do you know that also when Jesus, when he went back to heaven, it says, as it talks about being seen by angels, we realize that as he went back to heaven, the angels was the one that had to kind of snap all the disciples out of their being overwhelmed of saying, hey, why do you keep looking up into heaven? He's going to come back in the same way. You need to get ready. You need to get busy on what Christ has told you to do. And so he was seen by angels, and then it goes on to say he was preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. And so as we, we look at all these points, what was Jesus' last command to his disciples in Matthew 28, Mark 16, and Acts 1? You are going to be my witnesses here locally, stateside if you want to call it, nationally and internationally. And so he said that in Matthew 28, he gave the, what we know of as the Great Commission. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, because of that, because I've resurrected from the dead and I have been vindicated in the spirit, so to speak, going on that last section, go therefore and make disciples of how many people? All nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. In Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, right before Jesus went back to heaven, they were wanting to know when the kingdom was going to be restored. They were thinking that Jesus was going to clarify everything right then and make his new kingdom on earth. And he did, but not in a way they expected because we realize the kingdom of heaven is through the local church today. They were thinking Jesus was going to take over the whole world at that moment, but that's what wasn't what Jesus' plan was. And so in Acts 1, 7, and 8, he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. Remember, just as the Holy Spirit vindicated Jesus, so the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, and he says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, that's their local area, and all Judea, stateside, and Samaria, farther out and to the end of the earth. And so after he was preached among the nations, and that was the goal, and that's what we're doing today. Do you know, do you know even in recent years, the technology of Bible translations is getting so fast now, they've actually got a date where they're considering that they may have the Bible translated into every language in the world by 2033, 2035, because with technology and all the bad that goes with technology, also is so good that what Paul started in an amazing way of taking the gospel out, now God is using so many billions of people to take it to the last unreached people groups. Uh, and we may have the Bible in almost every translation and uh, in every language in the next decade to 15 years. How amazing is that? And so he told us to take it. God is sending obedient people to do that. And it says he was believed on in the world. That started in the book of Acts not only with the Jewish people, but then the Samaritans who were half Jewish, half Gentile, then to completely Jew, uh, non-Jewish people like you and me. And so he's now being believed on in the world. And it says this, and he was taken up in glory. And so as he's taken up in glory, we know that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father now. We, we rest in that fact that not only is, is he overseeing, and watching his church, but he dwells with and among his church. He dwells in the power of the Holy Spirit through the power of the word. And as we think about him being taken back to heaven, what do we think about with him being taken back to heaven? That we are excitedly awaiting his return that could come at any moment. We live every generation. I love spending time with older believers that have walked with Jesus for years because the older they get, the more they're saying, I'm looking even more than ever for Jesus to return before God calls me home. He may call me home, but I'm looking even more. And so us as maybe younger believers who are maybe not quite at that age yet, we need to live with that expectancy that as he was taken up in glory, that we actively await his turn. Here's what I want to leave you with today. Throughout the ages, whether we're talking about all the church letters in the New Testament, whether we're talking about all church history through the last 2,000 years, or whether we're talking about Wiregrass Church in Wesley Chapel today as we meet locally, as uh, the good news goes out uh, across the airwaves, through the internet. Do you know what the biggest battle in every church in all of history is? It's the battle for truth. It always has been, and it always will be. The one reminder the one concern the one beware that's given in every new testament letter is 
watch out for false teaching and false teachers. And so here they had this ancient Christian hymn that summed up all of the gospel that we may not appreciate the poetic device that was in the original Greek and Hebrew, but he sums up the gospel in just a few short, very pointed lines, and it's the battle for truth. Because what did God say who the church was? Number one, how do we live in God's family? N number two, that we are the church, the set-apart people of the living God. And then number three, we are the pillar and the support of what? The truth. We're the pillar, the support, the foundation that the truth keeps going out. You see, culture is coming against the church left and right, and we shouldn't expect any different. But we continue to live with love and grace, but we can never compromise on truth, even if it may cost our life. Just like with Paul, just like with many in the church at Ephesus, and just like today. So while the false gods and the false idols thought they had the great pillars of what they believed in, their false idols... So today, you and I are one part. We are one column. We are one pillar. Uh, we are one part of support of continuing truth for the next generation. Many times you're going to feel like you're outnumbered, and that's okay. God has consistently worked through a small remnant throughout all of history. And so you as the local church, will you realize, number one, 1 Timothy teaches us how to live as God's family. Number one, we serve a living God, not a dead God like the church at Ephesus, not like the gods of America today, the, the idols of America today, but also we are support and a pillar of the truth.